he became a, a kind of cause celeb very quickly for a couple of reasons. His book was seen as scandalous. Um, it was full of, of dark revelations about college kids who were, who were uh, kissing in the back of cars, and it was all seen as very shocking. And, um, and, he, was, and he was seen as the voice of, of the young generation of, of a new America. And, um, and as I say, it was, a, it was a slightly scandalous novel, but it was also seen as, as having the mark of genius. And so he, he was a very exciting writer. People thought that he was, that he was representing a kind of new voice in, in America. And he proceeded to write uh, a, a several books very, very quickly. Um, and he, at the same time that his first novel came out, The Side of Paradise, he married a young woman named Zelda Sayre, uh, became Zelda Fitzgerald. They married within a week of The Side of Paradise coming out. And they were both extremely good looking. And, the, um, and they actually had a lot of charm and, and a lot of panache and, and uh, uh, great senses of humor. And so um, the, our notion of what it means to be a famous writer, to be a celebrity, uh, is, it really starts, starts to, to come to fruition in the early 1920s. There are early examples of what to us is a very familiar uh, um, instance. And so Sarah, give me a sense of what you mean by famous. So would it be famous as in, uh, the bookish crowd would think they're very famous, or would it mean that a, a housewife reading Sunday color magazines would find them, would think they were famous? Uh, you know, what, what, so how big is, does yeah. the film go outside the literary world? I mean, it does go outside the literary world because they become celebrities in that sense, that they become um, not, probably not household names, and certainly he's not that massive a bestseller. So he's not the equivalent of, say, Dan Brown, you know, the Da Vinci Code or something, or, or Harry Potter or something. He's not a global phenomenon. But he is um, certainly extremely well known in the literary world and famous enough to start to get out of the literary world. They start to make it into gossip columns. People are reading about them. They become parts of the stories of the rich and famous. So four housewives who are reading about what movie stars are up to, they're also going to encounter what Scott and Zelda are up to. So if Scott and Zelda lived today, they would be in Hello Magazine yeah, and they definitely. would be in the Daily Mail. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things that uh, happens in your book is uh, Scott, that comes clear is that Scott and Zelda were great kind of collectors of their own stuff. They collected all their magazine articles yeah. and kept scrapbooks. Did they really collect every single piece that was written about them? No, I actually managed to find a fair number of things that they hadn't, but also to, to trace back what they did find. Basically, they, they, they were self-Googling. I mean, that's basically what they were doing, but of course, they don't have Google. So what they were doing was combing through the newspapers for, uh, for mentions of them in the press and clipping them and putting them in a scrapbook and saving this mention of, of, uh, of what they found. Most authors in those days subscribed to a cutting service. Um, so it was how you would get your reviews because of course you don't have the internet. They couldn't search it out. And so they would pay somebody to go through the papers and find clippings about them, but they also were looking themselves. And did they like being famous? They loved being famous. They absolutely loved it. They were, having a, they were having a ball. I mean, one of the things to remember is how young they were. Zelda was 20, Scott was 24 when all of this started. And they're, in, as I say, they're, they're very attractive, they're very glamorous, um, and suddenly they're being invited to all the cool parties, they're being lionized, they're meeting all of their favorite authors, they're meeting all of the people that he admires, they're suddenly in the middle of everything, they're in the middle of New York, and they're seen as these spokesmen for the younger generation. They were having the time of their lives, they, they were completely having a riot, in more ways than one. <laughs> Let's talk about the parties. The parties, yeah. one of the things Sarah does in her book is give you a sense of how uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's life, uh, the world he lived in seeps into Gatsby, and Gatsby in that way, or in fact, was attacked at the time for being almost too newsy. Mm. Uh, it contained too much of current affairs. But, and of course, the big thing about Gatsby is it's, it's the great novel of parties. I don't mm. know whether, I can't think of another novel that does parties better than Gatsby. Tell us about uh, F. Scott and Zelda's partying. They, they kind of went up to some crazy stuff. They certainly did. Um, but uh, that was, it wasn't just them. I mean, they probably epitomized it, but it was very much part of the era. Um, but yeah, and they were all getting very, very drunk. I mean, it's, it's important to, to mention here prohibition. Um, America outlaws alcohol at the beginning of 1920, which is, I, I said in a, a session this morning, spectacularly backfired, um, and, it, and it was never enforced at all. And so people start actually start drinking like crazy. 
and they were drinking very powerful, they were drinking kind of raw alcohol. So they're getting drunk very, very fast on very powerful alcohol. And so they would, you know, they were all, they, they, they would strip off their clothes with some regularity and dance naked on tabletops. And um, one of the things I wanted to try to track down was when they talk about a wild party was how wild was it? And to get a sense for whether it just seemed comparatively wild to them because they're leaving the Edwardian era behind or whether we would think it was wild too. And um, they were having a lot more sex than, uh, than people might think that people were getting up to in the 1920s. Um, and uh, there are various kinds of orgies that are being described. Now, Scott and Zelda were a little bit more conservative than that, so they tended not to, to go the full um, a decadent route. Uh, but they were certainly, uh, they, I mean, Zelda writes a letter um, in 1922 to a friend of theirs who's come from across the country to visit them in New York. And she writes a letter on a Thursday saying, I'm so sorry I missed your whole visit, but I've been drunk for a week. And I didn't realize, I, I, she said, I thought I was going to see you, and then I didn't see you. She has a two-year-old daughter at this point, but she's been so drunk for a week that she doesn't, she thinks she hasn't seen their, their friends. And then as she's writing the letter, Scott says to her, no, we did see them. Don't you remember? We saw them on Monday night. And then she starts to piece together this story. So she's been so drunk for a week that she has absolutely no memory and is writing this letter apologizing for not having seen people that she actually saw. And there's a lot of that sort of thing. Um, but F. Scott Fitzgerald is more than just a pretty body boy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also someone who's kind of uh, startlingly, precociously ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, you write in his book that he's very, very, sh he absolutely is determined to be the greatest novelist there ever was. Yeah. And there's a kind of real confidence about him. How did, would tell us a bit more about that. Mm. Well, he, I think that as, as many great writers do, he, or great artists do, he had this, this core of confidence in himself. He knew that he had some kind of genius. He knew it. And um, the thing was that people didn't take him very seriously, particularly at the beginning. And it's hard for us now to remember, because he's seen as one of the great American writers, that at the time he was viewed more as a popular writer, that at the time he was seen as more commercial. And friends of his, including people like Edmund Wilson, who was very, very learned and became one of America's most eminent critics in the 20th century, Edmund Wilson always sneered at Scott because he thought he didn't know very much and he wasn't very well read. And Scott had been a bit lazy at university. He was, as you say, very precocious. Um, so he was one of those guys who kind of didn't work that hard. He actually flunked out of Princeton, which he always lied about afterwards. He said that he, he left because he was ill, and then he said he left to join the army at the end of the war, but he actually flunked out. Well, he was, he was politely asked to withdraw before he flunked out. Um, and um, not because he wasn't smart enough, but because he didn't work very hard. But in terms of literature, he was incredibly ambitious from the beginning. And he always said, I want to be one of the greatest writers who ever lived. Um, and one of the things that I try to do in the book is to give a sense as well that American literature itself is just finding its feet at this moment. All of his friends are trying to work out what an actual American literature might look like. Because until then, they've always been found uh, wanting in comparison to European literature. So they have a real kind of inferiority complex. And it's in the 20s that I think Virginia Woolf wakes up and says, you know, there's this new writing that's happening. In many ways, it feels, uh, as a publisher in India, you always get told, I always, you know, and I say, I'm guilty of saying it myself, I say, oh, the new hot thing is Pakistani writing, or the new hot thing is Sri Lanka writing. But people, there was a kind of real critical uh, uh, voice there at, the point, uh, at that point saying that, you know, there is now this new writing is from, uh, from America. Yeah, there's an American literature. She, Virginia Woolf actually makes this really interesting comparison where she says the Americans are doing what the Elizabethans did. They're coining new words. And she says, and it doesn't take much imagination to realize that where you're coining new words, you're going to create a new literature, and a new literature will come out of it. So she actually predicts that American literature is going to have this efflorescence, which is exactly what happened. And I want to come back to this idea that, uh, you know, before Gatsby, uh, Fitz Fitzgerald is seen as a more popular, mm. a glamorous writer mm -hmm. than a serious one. And of course, the thing about it is that this man who drinks too much needs, some, needs money to, to drink. And he makes his money writing stories. Yeah. This is, his, this is really what makes his income for most of his life. Yeah, absolutely. So he's writing commercial fiction for the magazines. And it's again, it's hard for us to, to cast our minds back to a time when that would have been a measure of your fame. But this is before uh, television, of course. Um, but it's also before radio, even. And so the main entertainment that people had in their homes was to read short fiction in commercial magazines. And they would read it aloud. In fact, 
um, Fitzgerald shows us that in the, at the beginning of The Great Gatsby, at the dinner party at the Buchanan's, Jordan reads to Tom from the Saturday Evening Post, which is exactly what people did to entertain themselves, or each other and themselves. And, um, and so the Saturday Evening Post was uh, a good example and, and the epitome of these uh, commercial so-called slick magazines. And they were incredibly well-paying. He was one of the richest writers in America because of this commercial fiction that he wrote. But that was more like being the Dan Brown of his era. Um, and that was where his real fame came from, certainly where all of his income came from. The book sold, his, basically what happened with his trajectory was that his first book was his most popular. And then his, in terms of sales, his popularity consistently slipped. As his books got more serious, they got less popular. And The Great Gatsby was his attempt to, to show to the people who were sneering at him for being commercial that he was a serious writer. And what happened was that he wrote this masterpiece that we all now recognize, that posterity has recognized, but it wasn't commercially successful at all. Nobody wanted to read it. Um, did writing come easy to Fitzgerald? Yeah, yeah, he was, very, he was a very fluent writer and he, he worried about it because he, he called it a fatal facility. Um, that it was that it was too easy, that it came too easily, and that it wasn't um, good enough. But he, or, or that he wasn't trying hard enough. But he was also a perfectionist, and so uh, uh, on the level of the word. And if you go back to the manuscripts of the Great Gatsby, you can see the way he's making these incredibly fine distinctions, crossing out one word and replacing it with a very near synonym, but that has a slightly different connotation or a slightly different rhythm. He did it. It was incredibly carefully composed. But he would write in great bursts of kind of fluency and then go back and polish, 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 polish. And did he do that when he was writing his commercial fix short stories? Was it, were they much more careless? No, they weren't actually. Um, he took great pride in them. He was a, he was a craftsman as well. He was, he was a consummate professional. One of the myths about Scott Fitzgerald that people still perpetrate, I see, or, or perpetuate, I see it in um, you know, newspapers sometimes where people bring him up and they say, oh, he was a talented amateur. Um, and it really annoys me. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it, it's a calumny. He was not a talented amateur. He was, a, he was an absolute pro about his writing. He was careless about everything else, but he was never careless about his writing. So when, so when we begin this book, it's 1924. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald is the glamorous literary boy. Mm -hmm. He's got a very glamorous wife. They go to all the parties. One of the other interesting things is, of course, that they're not just partying with other writers, but Hollywood actresses, mm -hmm. directors, theater people. It's a kind of big world of showbiz, yeah. arts, culture. Um, and he, and as the book starts, he decides he's going to become a little serious. Yeah. He's going to try and be a good boy. He's going to not live in New York. He's going to live in this, in uh, Long Island, uh, and he's going to write a great masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Is there a pr is when he, when he decides he's going to do that, is he scared? Is there a pressure on him? Oh, there's an enormous amount of pressure. But I think so, so what happens is the, the, my book actually starts, as you say, in 1924, as he and Zelda sail for France. Um, and he's decided to actually, I, I sort of start with a, a kind of flashback, so that, or a flash forward, um, because he's decided to leave all of the parties yeah. of New York behind and go be serious in France, where he's going to um, escape all the distractions yeah, yeah. of yes. celebrity life in New York. But then the, the story proper cuts back to 1922, which is when yeah. they moved to Long Island. And so for two years, he's actually partying. And then he goes to France and decides it's time to knuckle down and get serious and to really work on this book. I don't think he was scared, though. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on him. It was almost all self-generated. And But I think he was excited. He, he knew he could. Uh, you get the sense from his letters that he had this own, his own sense of a kind of, uh, of, a, of a rising wave in him. That he, he had the sense of, of you know, that, that, that he was starting to take flight and, and he knew what his power was. And he was ready to, to, extend, you know, to, to perpetuate the metaphor. He was ready to, to extend his wings and see what he could do. He was tired of things distracting him from it. And what he wanted to do was have the peace and quiet to, to test himself, to find out what he was capable of. He has a wonderful phrase in a letter that he writes to his editor just before he submits the book, which I absolutely love, where he says, I need to, I need to, um, I can't, I can't send the book to you unless it has the very best that I am capable of in it, or as I sometimes think, something better than I am capable of. Um, the idea that he would actually do something better than he was capable of. It's an oxymoron, but I think it's a beautiful one. And uh, Fitzgerald ambition, Fitzgerald's ambition for Gatsby was to write a novel that captured America at the time. Yeah. Uh, and so let's go to America at the time. What is America like in the 20s? Um, well, it is uh, an absolutely chaotic uh, 
time in America. Um, prohibition means that um, the, sorry, it's, getting a little, it's a little distracting, isn't it? Um, the, um, in a sense, what happens with prohibition, because it backfires, is that all bets are off to a certain extent. And a, and a period of, of real lawlessness starts to, uh, to ensue. At first, it's kind of um, trivial stuff. It's kind of petty uh, misdemeanor. Uh, um, and, and then the, the crimes get more serious. And um, so that by the late 1920s, as, as everybody knows, we have things like Al Capone and the gangsters running America. In the, in the early 1920s, there's just this sense that, um, that the, the, old, the old shackles have been, have been flung off and there's a new freedom and a new energy and, a, and, a, and all kinds of new opportunities. One of the things I say um, at the beginning of my book is that this is a book about possibility. And I think that America felt that it was a time of possibility. There was this sense that everything was, was about to take off. And, um, but what they were actually doing was getting drunk, chasing money, and, uh, and, and our sort of sense of what American culture looks like starts to emerge at that time. It's a time where uh, uh, the, the entrepreneurs who make enormous amounts of money, don't they? Yeah. Uh, and almost all of this money is, uh, has a kind of illegal beginning. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about that world? Yeah, absolutely. So well, what we have is um, the kind of monopoly capitalism that we're looking at now um, is really taking off in the, in the 1920s. The, the stock market is booming. There's, there are almost no regulations on it. All kinds of things that are deeply unethical and uh, not to say uh, they, they were unethical, they weren't illegal, uh, were, they could just do with impunity. So people were, were all kinds of frauds that, that now you know, you, even now, where we did, we're not a very regulated uh, economy, people couldn't get away with this kind of stuff at all. Where they would just, um, they would, they would make pretend to sell stocks that they weren't selling. They would, um, there was just kind of open fraud and open cheating, and people were making all kinds of fortunes. Um, they were cornering the markets. There were there were very few restrictions about monopolies and. And, um, and so people, through, through various kinds of financial chicanery, were getting very rich very fast. And that's one of the reasons why Fitzgerald has, has Gatsby. Um, at the end, the implication is that Gatsby is dealing in stolen bonds. Because he wants Gatsby not just to be a bootlegger, but to be involved in the various kinds of corruption of American society at that time. And the financial corruption that's going on there is such that it leads to, the, to what they called the boom, but was really a bubble which then bursts with the stock market crash of 1929. And the, the regulations that America then enacted to try to stop that from happening, the Glass-Steagall regulations, were what were repealed to allow our crash. And so I was very interested in the fact that the parallels were so strong. An example I gave this morning is that um, in America, the recent crash was really associated with a fraudster called Bernie Madoff, um, who was involved in a Ponzi scheme. And the first Pon the Ponzi scheme is named for an Italian swindler named Charles Ponzi, who perpetrated his fraud in 1920, and who is in the papers in 1922 as Scott Fitzgerald is thinking about the Great Gatsby. There are these headlines saying, you know, um, America is a land of Ponzi's, and they said America itself is a country for speculators. It's a country for it's it's basically all a gold rush, and and Fitzgerald is is. Um, is uh, uh, taking all of this in and it's kind of percolating in his head while he's thinking about what Gatsby's going to be about. And uh, New York in particular is a city that's just beginning to become New York, yeah. isn't it? And you have this one, there are two facts you have in the book uh, which I love. One is that you say that the New York yellow cab that mm. is so sort of epitomizes New York for us today didn't exist in the 20s. You had cabs of different colors. Yeah. Uh, and the other fact you said is that, you know, we see, we think of New York or any modern city as a kind of brightly lit. Yeah. Most of New York was dark. It was dark. So the, um, the buildings aren't as tall as we think they are. Um, they were still building them. They thought a skyscraper was 12 stories. You know, that, so when they talk about skyscrapers, they're talking about buildings that to us would seem kind of stunted. And they, and they think it's brightly lit, but that's because they have one big neon sign. But actually none of the buildings would have been lit up. And the, the city itself is not electrified, to use their word, um, until the late 1920s. They don't have neon signs until 28 and 29. In the early 1920s, they're still using a lot of gas fuel as well. So some rich people have electricity. Poor people are using uh, gas and coal, as, and some electricity is kind of a mix. And, uh, but what you don't have is a full kind of electric infrastructure of uh, you know, the way that we have and that we imagine. 
And it's those uh, coal fires, the fuel fires, that create the, the famous Valley of Ashes that opens um, the beginning of chapter two, the wasteland in The Great Gatsby, when you drive past these ash heaps. Those are not a, a figment of Fitzgerald's imagination. They were real dumps of coal ash uh, from a city that was not fully electric yet. Yet New York was still the most exciting city you could oh, be in. Absolutely, it was modern life. It was, it, it's just, what, we just have to see it as, it's all relative, right? So we have to see that for them it was incredibly frantic and incredibly big and incredibly bright and incredibly loud. But to us it would seem comparatively subdued because it's just continued to go in that direction um, ever since. But for them it was absolutely, it was where all of the energy was. It was where everything was happening in America. It was where you had to be. It was, it was you know, riding the crest of a wave and that was where you went. And it was, it was clearly a very exciting time to be there. People were, were sort of you know, getting high on the experience of being in New York itself and feeling like you were at the epicenter. Um, one of the things I love about Sarah's book, this is just the most wonderful thing, is she made a list of all the new words that were coined between 1918 and 1922, which I wanted to read out because uh, if you want just a kind of in two minutes to know how the modern world was created, you get it in these list of words. Yeah, sure. um, yeah I thought this, uh, when I was looking, the, I should explain how this list came about because I was, um, I was checking for anachronisms. I wanted to make sure that I didn't use, in trying to evoke the 1920s, that I didn't inadvertently use um, words that, uh, that as are, are anachronistic. And I was trying to figure out a way to talk about the fact that the Fitzgeralds were cool. And I thought, well, I can't call them cool because obviously that's not a 1920s term. And then I thought, well, actually, I should check. And so I just looked it up. And um, the earliest uh, uh, known usage of the word cool in our slangish meaning to mean hip um, is from 1918. And that surprised me a lot. And then it turns out that hip was also, uh, in fact, current. And Fitzgerald uses it in this side of paradise. He also is uh, credited with being the first person to um, to use the word wicked as a term of approval, which I, I thought of as a 90s thing until I was reading The Side of Paradise and then realized he's actually the first to do it. And so this to me became an example of what I was saying a moment ago about the really strong parallels between the early 1920s and our era that a lot of the words that I found actually struck my ear and obviously have struck other people as being incredibly modern and very, very surprising to learn that they were first coined um, in the early 1920s. So um, here's the list. I'm, I'm, there, there's some swearing in this, which I hope won't offend anyone. Uh, cool, motherfucker, teenage, wimp, debunk, encode, hypermodern, multipurpose, power play, existentialism, columnist, cartwheel, extrovert, fantasist, fascist, publicized, mass media, feedback, slenderized, slinky, sadomasochistic, homosexually, post feminist, biracial, racialized, race baiter, to ace, French kiss, fucked off, psyching, tearjerker, fundamentalism, bagel, ad lib. Mock-up, prefabricated, atom bomb, supersonic, ultrasonic, hitchhike, comfort zone, junkie, market research, off the rack, food chain, nutritionist, checkup, comparison shopping, devalue, white collar, posh, upgrade, ritzy, swankiness, nouveau pour, sophisticate, cross-selling, inflationary, deflationary, merchant bank, arbitrage, subprime, our old friend. And the year 1922 alone, which is the year that Fitzgerald sets The Great Gatsby in, the year 1922 alone added brand name Hollywood, movie going, rough cut, performative, robot, sparkly, schlep, dimwit, no brow, oops, multi layered, rebrand, mass market, broadcasting and broadcaster, finalized, lame, sexiness, transvestite, gigolo, to proposition, libidinal, post Freudian, cold turkey, quantum mechanics, polyester, vacuum, notepad, duplex, Rolex, entrepreneurial, and party <laughs> crashing to English. <laughs> I mean, I think those words give you, they, they tell you everything about that period. Uh, and of course, if you, if you just looked at those words and you thought, what are the themes that arise from them, you realize uh, the creation of a financial system. Mm. Uh, you're, you're getting words. Merchant banking is invented uh, in the early 1920s. Uh, inflationary, deflationary. And of course, our narrator in Gatsby uh, is, a, is a merchant banker. He's he a stockbroker. He is indeed. He's a bond trader. And that's what Gatsby tries, Gatsby tries to get Nick. He tries to inveigle him into a corrupt bond scheme. And Nick is tempted. And it's what, if you were a clever young man who came out of Princeton or something like that, this is what you would do. You would go and join an investment bank. Absolutely. Bank. If, if we were to write a, a, a novel about The Great Gatsby today and set it in America, he would be a hedge fund manager. Yeah. Without any question, that's what he would be. He would be the guy who goes and manipulates the stock markets, and um, and that's how he gets rich fast. But he does it in a very dodgy, unethical way, and that's where the moral dilemma would come from. 
And of course, the other theme that is kind of absolutely clear is that sex uh, and uh, and that you know homosexuality. Well, one of the things that uh, isn't mentioned yet. I don't know when the word orgasm is coined, but the female orgasm is kind of talked about more seriously in this time mm. uh, than any other. Tell us a bit more about that, about what, what's happening with sex in America mm. at this point. Well, this is really in America, this is the first sexual revolution. So the sexual revolution of the 1960s is really properly speaking the second one. And the, the first sexual revolution in the 1920s happens for a couple of reasons. It happens most importantly because women get the vote in America in 1920. So they can vote, that means that they can take certain kinds of legal power as well as political power. And then they start to get certain kinds of economic power as well. And that means that they're going to take control over their own bodies, as we all know that that's one of the things that happens as women get uh, legal and political autonomy. So, um, but one of the interesting things that I found as I was reading about this, I, I knew a little bit about this in terms of the context of feminism. What I didn't realize was that part of what happened also was that it had to do with the First World War. Um, the American government had a campaign to try to eradicate venereal disease. So they actually started sex education for the first time. Um, and what that meant was that they started to explain contraception to ordinary Americans. And it became more available once people understood kind of what the, uh, what the principles were a little bit better. And, um, and also they started to talk about something called companionate marriage. They started, there was this new revolutionary idea that maybe women should like marriage too. And that maybe marriage could be an equal partnership. And that maybe women might even enjoy sex. And they started to talk about this thing called the female orgasm with some surprise that maybe women were actually enjoying this too. And then the women started to speak up and, and said that indeed they were. <laughs> and you have this wonderful anecdote, um, you know, when, when modernity sweeps up a, a country or, a, a, or a, you know, anywhere, really the place where we first see it is in women's lives. Yeah. And the flapper, which is a big part of 20s, um, I mean, across, you're the first world, you're the West, um, is, is a sign of these changing times, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because mm -hmm. she's just a very cool, hip, modern, girl yeah. um, and you have this wonderful story of a woman who is in transparent pajamas <laughs> uh, and she's walking four cats on a on she's leave. like the kind of, she's like one of the first streakers in, yeah. in America. Yeah she gets so the police are so what happens is she's walking up Fifth Avenue in November in transparent pajamas and she's leading four cats on leads and um, the police a crowd gathers to see this basically naked young woman in November so she's presumably a little bit chilly and um, the police are called, and this crowd gathers, and um, it, somebody, it was, a policeman finally works out that what she's doing is enacting the cat's pajamas, which is a current bit of slang in the 1920s. But basically, that what she's, it's a publicity stunt, which is also a new idea and a new phrase. The notion of a publicity stunt to just try to get yourself into the papers um, was something that they're, they're all sort of startled by. So the police um, sent her home without ever getting her, she doesn't get her name in the papers, just the story, which I think must have disappointed her very much. But certainly she's using sexuality there to get noticed, absolutely. And Zelda, of course, is the epitome of the flapper girl. Yeah. She is the, if, would you say that, you know, they were really a power couple in that, like, he's cooler because she's there with oh, him. Oh, definitely. They were, they were definitely one of those celebrity couples where their celebrity exponentially multiplies um, because of each other. So there's a kind of synergy there where they both start to, to feed off of each other. Um, Zelda is somebody who I uh, became fonder and fonder of as I worked on the book. And I, she's much smarter than people, I think, give her credit for. She was very, very clever, very witty and very charming. People really were drawn to her. She was incredibly charismatic. And there are all of these stories about, about you know, the funny things that she would say and, and the ways that, um, that people were drawn to her. And, um, and she was somebody who did not suffer fools and did not play by the rules and was not going to, to be the kind of conventional good wife of an author. There's a great um, a story that I like where they, um, a magazine came to uh, famous authors' wives or, or famous wives or something and asked them for their um, favorite recipes. And Zelda was having none of this, and so she completely took the mickey out of it. And she said, she said, okay, I'll give my favorite recipe for breakfast, which is ask the cook if there's any bacon, and then ask the cook to fry it for you. 
<laughs> That's her favorite recipe for breakfast. And uh, in fact, Fitzgerald used to kind of uh, plagiarize in the right word, but he actually directly lifted uh, her, her, her words and her sentences yeah. into his book. He did. And so we have um, Zelda's voice is vividly we do. alive in Gatsby. We do, and, and in The Sight of Paradise, yeah. indeed. Um, and, and yeah, and, and he's certainly been taken to task for this because he didn't necessarily give her sufficient credit for the, for the passages that he lifted. And then people start to say things like, oh, Zelda Fitzgerald really wrote the novels, which is ridiculous. But she certainly did create some of the memorable lines that have been uh, you know, handed down, such as Daisy's um, famous statement in Gatsby that she hopes that her daughter will be a beautiful little fool because that's the best thing a girl can be in this world is a beautiful little fool. And that is what Zelda said when their daughter was born. So that is absolutely Zelda's line put in Daisy's mouth. And there are some other lines like that. And yet, even as they're a couple that feed each other and are kind of glittering in the outside world, uh, they have a kind of very destructive marriage. And uh, through the book, you have lots of, uh, particularly F. Scott Fitzgerald's friends, concerned friends, constantly saying to each other, uh, they're, they're charmed by her when they meet her, but kind of behind her back, they're always saying, God, you know, he's never going to write if she's around, mm. and he's, she's going to dry up all his talent, and she's crazy. It, w tell us more about that destructive side of their marriage. Do you think it was more bad than good? No, I don't, actually. I think that it was, it was a relationship that went wrong um, for a couple of reasons. But it didn't go, it never went entirely wrong. It, they both self-destructed, but they didn't, uh, their relationship actually managed to survive in, in, in strange ways. They absolutely loved each other. They were completely devoted to each other. They were very, very young, as I've already said, and um, they were fairly adolescent in their relationship to each other. So they, used to, they would go out and make each other jealous, and they would do all kinds of things that are not really the basis for a solid marriage. You know, I mean, they would just play all kinds of, of you know, childish, you know, games about, uh, you know, she would, fl she would kiss his friends to try to make him jealous. And but she was 20, you know, so 20-year-olds, with apologies to 20-year-olds in the audience, sometimes 20-year-olds do sort of silly things. I certainly did when I was 20, you know. So. Um, I think to a certain extent we have to give them a little bit of leeway for just being young and a little bit foolish. Um, she was very much a dilettante, and it is true that at first she couldn't see why. She, she thought that making lots of money writing commercial fiction was great, and why should he be going off and writing these serious novels? And she thought we were just, she just wanted to have fun. And um, she did certainly object to his uh, retiring into these kind of, you know, hermit-like states where he would go and try to write his novels, and she would get bored and feel neglected, and she'd go off and have a flirtation and possibly go off and have an affair. And um, so that was certainly, you know, destructive behavior. But we haven't, we haven't, we've talked about drinking in general, but not about his drinking in specific. And um, by, by the, uh, the mid-1920s, his drinking problem is really starting to take off. So he wasn't, you know, uh, he wasn't easy to be married to either. Um, and, um, and, and what happens is that Zelda gets more serious as she gets older and starts to understand art and starts to understand dedication. And um, so for me, it was, it was mostly that they were very young. But what happens is that then his drinking problem becomes very serious and she actually has a psychiatric breakdown. Um, she, uh, this was a, uh, after uh, Gatsby was published. This is in uh, 1930. She has a breakdown and is put into a psychiatric hospital. His drinking spirals out of control, and they basically spend the 30s uh, kind of falling apart. But they're writing these incredibly touching letters to each other about, you know, he writes her these unbelievably moving letters about- Right, saying, almost to the, till the right, end. Absolutely till the end. Um, saying that the only thing that matters is her getting better and coming home to him, that that's the only thing that he cares about. There's this wonderful letter that he writes after Tender as the Night came out in 1934, which he pinned all his hopes on in it, and it, uh, it flopped, and he was, it pushed him over the edge. And that was when he had the breakdown that he later memorialized in the so-called crack-up essays. And Zelda wrote him this really protective letter. She read the reviews of Tender's the Night, and, and she wrote him saying, those critics just don't understand you, and they, and they, and they have nothing to compare the beauty and the joy of what, you've, of what you've achieved here. And he wrote her back, and he said, I can hold all of contemporary criticism in the palm of my hand. All that I care about is, what, is how you are and what you're doing and for you to come back to me. Um, and, and so it's hard for me to read those sorts of letters and conclude that this is a marriage that, that destroyed itself. They were both falling apart, but the marriage actually remained a, strangely remained this very strong bond. There was, um, as you talk, I wonder whether um, the thing about the Fitzgeralds is that um, at the, when they were strongest, they created this very vivid world together, mm. didn't they? Uh, and people were drawn into their web. 
Uh, and, and it's funny because when, I mean, I want to take it to Great Gatsby, the book, mm. uh, and Gats you've described Gatsby, the novel, and the writing of it. You say that, you, that Fitzgerald was a symbolic writer. Yeah. Uh, that the things that make him beautiful is that he, uh, every th the things were glittering, but there was always an additional meaning, always yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. Um, and it, is, there, is there a way, I'm, it's, this is, I'm, I'm going to see if I can articulate this well, but is there a way to say that um, there's a way in which Zelda and Scott make a kind of glittering world, mm -hmm. uh, and they see a world in a very particular way. It's a world of crazy parties and being charming and being mean to someone and making up with them and uh, being locked in a kind of world together, absolutely in belief of each other. Absolutely. And um, and that th there's a way in which the symbolicness of Gatsby, a way in which you feel like this. Scott's just created a kind of world into mm. itself. Yeah. Uh, that is something that comes out of the world that he and Zelda create. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it is how his imagination worked. And it is how it is. It was his view of the world. Um, he, he was a tremendous romantic. And one of the things to, to realize about, about Fitzgerald is that he's someone who's, um, to put it in, in slightly simple terms, his head and his heart were often in conflict. So he had this very romantic imagination and this very romantic heart, and he wanted the world to be a beautiful place, and he wanted to be surrounded by beautiful things, and life should be gorgeous, and it should be luxurious, and it should be fabulous. But he had a really great critical intelligence, and so he knew in his head that, this, that life couldn't be that romantic affair. And what happens in, in Gatsby is that he conveys both of those things simultaneously. That sense of romantic readiness, that sense of possibility, that life ought to be a great and grand and glorious affair, and then the constant recognition that it's never going to quite live up to that. And so there's this constant tug of disillusion, and then, and then the resurgence of illusion, and the importance of illusion, and then the tug of disillusion Yet the again. language of Gatsby, which you've talked about, uh, and it's why I love it, uh, is, a, is a language of exquisite beauty. Absolutely. I mean, you know, sentences sparkle. There is, uh, I can't think of a book where I find the prose as beautiful mm. as I find. The, the prose in, in Gatsby is really incredible. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to understand better exactly how it worked and to, and to go, you know, dig deep and look at, uh, at, at how Fitzgerald creates the effects that he creates. And as you said, he, he does a couple of things. One is that he, he uses the language of sensuality incredibly well. Um, particularly in the party scenes. One of the reasons why the party scenes are so vivid in Gatsby is because everything is connected to a sense, to one of the five senses, Tus taste, touch, scent. Um, and, but what he does is he uses synesthesia a lot. So he, he connects them in unexpected ways that are incredibly vivid. So um, in the first party scene in Gatsby, he describes yellow cocktail music. Um, and he talks, it, music has a tendency to turn into liquid. And the, so these images, are, and, and, and cocktails float, women float, there's a lot of floating in this novel. Things have a tendency to defy, defy the laws of gravity. Um, he, he, he untethers everything from gravity and lets it float up into this kind of magical, enchanted world. And of course, that's also what the novel is about. And so on a very fundamental level, his language is echoing the effects, the, the, the content and the ideas that he's trying to evoke, ideas about Gatsby aspiring to this enchanted world, aspiring uh, and, and fixing all of his aspiration to enchanted objects. But there's also something slightly intoxicated about, the, about the style. It's as if, uh, if, if if Scott spent two years just being drunk, which mm. he did, mm. uh, some of that drunken quality, that lovely feeling when everything's hazy and uh -huh. delicious, uh, is it seeps into the writing. Absolutely. It's a kind of... There's uh, a glow that goes yeah. all the way through it. It's like a champagne glow that just permeates the text. And um, this is what I uh, find the most difficult, uh, hardest for me to kind of the one... Uh, I, you know, I think often with great books, the reason we love them is because we don't completely understand them. Mm. Uh, and what I don't understand about Gatsby is this, that on one hand, uh, the world he describes, he describes which a kind of a, a heady romance. Mm. And he's put in the middle of it, uh, we just talked about it before we came here, is the, possibly the most radical thing about Great Gatsby is that Gatsby in another novel would have been the villain. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a corrupt uh, businessman. Uh, with, uh, with, with his fingers in all kinds of dodgy pies. Yep. Uh, who's probably killed a man. Who's probably killed a man. Or more, more and, than one. And in, in, so you have a tiny little book where the man who would have been a villain is the hero. Mm. And a language suffused with uh, 
uh, with sparkle and twinkle and, uh, and all the kind of language of exquisiteness. And he's also at the same time, uh, you, you know, you said in the book that um, one of the things that Fitzgerald is trying to do in this book, one of the things that he's always written uh, against, uh, even as, as he was working on the book, was he was very against this new kind of crony capitalism yeah. that had risen, the new kind of vulgar money that he felt was a kind of great corruption mm. uh, and a kind of festering sore in American life. I can't, I can't manage to merge those two things. So the, the, the kind of easy criticism of this world uh, and yet a kind of central delight in money and the pleasures mm. of money uh, and this intense sympathy for a man who should be a villain. Yeah. I mean, how, how do they all add up? I think that Fitzgerald is, is writing it from the inside of something that's going awry in America. And he can see that it's going awry much more clearly and much more quickly than anybody else in America. He gets there a good 30 years ahead of anybody else. Um, and it is the way that America has continued to go. But he himself was already caught up in that. So it's, um, it's again, an example of what I was saying a moment ago about his head and his heart being in conflict. I think it's a great novel about ambivalence. Um, the, that, that what we have, it, uh, we're, we're pulled in two different directions. He did love luxury, but I think that's the artist in him as well. The artist who loves, again, sensuality, who loves things to be gorgeous. He just wants life to be this incredibly gorgeous affair all the time. And guess what? You need money um, for things to be gorgeous all the time, in that sense, you know, to have opulent surroundings. And, um, but he also recognizes that, um, that materialism and, and conspicuous consumption is, is not um, going to, you know, is, is not actually is, is actually narrowing our possibilities instead of expanding them, and he can he can understand that. He he knows that aspiration ought to be bigger, and so I think that his sympathy for Gatsby comes from the fact that I, I think the way he writes Gatsby is about a man who is the soul of an artist and is corrupted by the world that he lives in into becoming that dodgy businessman that you described. But that's so isn't that too romantic a vision well, of a kind of like a criminal? <laughs> sure, but it's but, but he's not. But he doesn't let Gatsby off the hook. What he's saying is, I mean, I think it's important that Gatsby dies. <laughs> he doesn't get he doesn't get away with it. He, he and it's important that he um, that his his failings are very specific failings. So I think that the the point is that America is creating a country where people with immense potential, like Jay Gatsby, just become seedy crooks and die in swimming pools. Sorry to spoil the ending for anybody who doesn't know uh, what happens at the end of the book. Um, that it's, so that the, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale. Um, and, but the celebration is to say that none of this changes, that he had this tremendous sense of life's possibilities, and that's what Fitzgerald wants to celebrate, but not the, the, I think we have to turn it around. I would just say that it's a, it's a romantic novel that, real, that recognizes that romanticism won't necessarily end very well. You had uh, in the book that very nice quote uh, that T.S. Eliot used about something, mm. Mm. but I think uh, it sums up uh, the ambivalence in Fitzgerald that I'd love you to tell the audience. Yeah. He says, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it verbatim, but he says, um, he's actually talking about a different writer, but I thought that it was, it was very apropos of Fitzgerald. He says words to the effect of, um, he, was the, uh, he was the most perfect critic of a society in which he was also the most perfect conformist. Um, and, and I think that's what I mean, that he was, he was criticizing it from within. He was absolutely caught up in it, but he could also see where it was taking them all and how dangerous it was. And he absolutely predicts the road that America has continued to go down, and indeed much of the rest of the world has continued to follow. I mean, I was listening to Rana Dasgupta um, earlier today talk about new money in Delhi, and he could have been describing the world of the great Gatsby. I mean, the language was incredibly similar. And, and that's what I mean by saying that for Fitzgerald, the, I think the tragedy of the, of the novel is that there, there was all of this hope and all of this possibility in America that Jay Gatsby represents, which is not, which is not really about, it's not about the United States, right? It's about what America represents as a place where people can fulfill their own potential, as a place where anybody can come and opportunity is there and anything, that, you know, the sky's the limit. You just have to imagine your way into a better world. And that what happens is that by the 1920s, Fitzgerald can see that all of that kind of imaginative possibility has narrowed itself down into this crass materialism that's about who has the biggest house. And, and that's what he is, you know, that's absolutely what he's getting at. But that, that doesn't mean that he doesn't still love that romance with possibility. And that's what he wants to, to celebrate. You know, it's funny, as you say this, I wonder whether uh, 
Gatsby is in some ways a portrait of Fitzgerald. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that um, Scott Fitzgerald is, is partly in Gatsby and he's partly in Nick Carraway. We haven't talked about Nick Carraway, but he's incredibly important. And so if you want to get a sense of what Scott Fitzgerald is like, you have to kind of try to create a composite of Nick and Gatsby, and then you start to get a sense of what Scott Fitzgerald was like. But he wasn't a crook, I hasten to add. He's not completely like uh, Jay Gatsby. And it's important, he was a moralist, actually. So he thought it was very important that Jay Gatsby was a crook. And he thought it would, and, and he talks about that in his letters. He, he, he doesn't want anybody to misunderstand that Gatsby's a crook, and that matters. But he can't resist writing a novel about corruption and about crime. Uh, in the most uh, exalted terms, mm. and make. Uh, but he make doesn't this. exalt the crime, does he? No, but but it's a. But you know, the reading Gatsby's. Uh, to, I mean, of, there are many, many novels. Uh, you know, you take Rana's book, uh, a capital. They're books that are that feel dark as you read them. And it's not a word I would use for Gatsby. But see, it is a word I would use for Gatsby, which is part of what my book is actually about and what I'm trying to do. We haven't mentioned there's a, there's a murder story that I also thread through, which is a, ver a real life murder story that happened at the end of 1922 as Scott and Zelda returned to New York. And it's a very dark story. And that's exactly why I put it there, because I feel like what's happened with The Great Gatsby is that it's such a loved novel. And it is a glamorous and a romantic and an enchanted novel in the ways that we've been talking about. Fitzgerald's prose is so wonderful in the ways that we've been talking about that it tends to carry people away and they and they and it's like they, they leave the book and there's this there's this kind of happy hangover of that language and that's yeah. what they remember. And and it and it tends to distract our attention away from what is actually I think a great deal of darkness and a great deal also of very acidic satire that's also in the book. And so what I wanted to try to do is to create a slightly different frame for the novel so that so that, that darkness would start to become visible because I think it is there. I'm gonna we're gonna go over to questions, but I wanna I have to end asking you what you thought of the most recent film, Gatsby's very much in the air at the moment, yeah. uh, in yeah. all kinds of ways. And did you think the film was true to the book? Um, no, I didn't. And I know a lot of people have liked the film, so I don't want to uh, step on anyone's feelings. But I didn't like the film for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I, I'll, say, I'll first say, say what I did like about the film, which I think DiCaprio was terrific, and I think he's the best Screen Gatsby by far. Um, and, and so I think that makes the movie, yeah. uh, carries the movie to a great extent. I think the problem for me, um, I've said this before, and, and the, the, because I do get asked this question fairly often, as, as you might expect, and the more I think about it, the more I think this is right, is that I think it's the movie that Jay Gatsby would have made of his own story, but it's not the movie that Scott Fitzgerald would have made. Um, it, is a, it is a film that is enthralled to all of that materialism that we were just talking about. It thinks the parties are fabulous, but Scott Fitzgerald thought the parties were kind of tacky. Um, and he sure thought the house was tacky. There's a, there's a line that for me encapsulates this. Um, at the end of the novel, Nick says, just before his great elegy for America, he says um, that he went to look at Gatsby's house, and he describes it as that huge, incoherent failure of a house. He says, I went to look at it once more. Lerman retains that line, but he cuts the word failure. He says, I went to look at his huge, incoherent house once more. And when I heard him say that, I just thought, well, that's it. You don't want it to be a failure. You want this to be a success story. You want this to be a story about the American dream. But it's not a story about the American dream. It's a story about American failure. It's a story about Gatsby not getting anything that he wants. And it's about the limits of aspiration, the limits of possibility. And Lerman doesn't want it to be about that. In much the way we were just saying, I think, he, he, he came away with that same glamorous hangover that everybody else has. And so he wanted that glamour. But to me, that's not true to the novel that I think that Scott Fitzgerald put on the page that is there if we go look at it carefully and, and trust words like failure. Pay attention to words like failure and don't cut them out because they, because they, don't, uh, they aren't consistent with our sense of what we think. It's as, it's as if Lerman was editing. Oh, you didn't mean for that to be a failure. It wasn't a failure. Well, I think he meant failure. That's why it's there. <laughs> Over to questions. Uh, first, a oh. comment. It was reported in the Australian press that Baslam claimed never to have read the book. So say, say that again. It was reported in the Australian press that Baz Luhrmann claimed he had never read the book when he made the film. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's just a comment. Uh. But my question is, um, your comments about the relationship between um, Zelda and Scott and this loving marriage bond which they had. But Hemingway in his uh, book about them in Paris yeah. actually claims that she was always accusing him of being sexually completely hopeless. Yeah. 
Yeah. So have you any comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, Hemingway's A Movable Feast, which is written uh, across the 1950s. Um, he's working on it at the time that he commits suicide in 1961 and is finally published in 1964 in a heavily edited version. Um, Hemingway is probably the least reliable source we have about Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. He hated Zelda, and the feeling was totally mutual. Um, Zelda uh, thought that Hemingway was, uh, she described his novels as being about um, bullfighting, bullslinging, and bullshit. Um, and um, she actually said she thought, he was, she thought he was ridiculously macho, and she thought he was overcompensating, and, and she, they, they, so for, they just didn't like each other. Um, by the time that Hemingway writes A Movable Feast, Fitzgerald, so, so what happens is that when, when uh, Fitzgerald and Hemingway, this is a complicated story, I'm gonna try to do it quickly. When Fitzgerald and Hemingway meet, Fitzgerald is the famous writer that we were describing. Hemingway is a young, aspiring writer who nobody's ever heard of. And their stars start to cross. So what happens is Fitzgerald's fortunes start to drop. Hemingway becomes the most famous writer in America and he becomes the celebrity and, he's, and, and his myth starts to take off. Hemingway is also an alcoholic um, and he is also subject to the depression that will eventually kill him. Um, and he, so he is himself starting to fall apart in important kinds of ways. And he's, um, what, what happened then was when Fitzgerald died, Fitzgerald was basically forgotten. Um, his, the, the last year of his life, his uh, royalty statements show that um, the, in the last 12 months, he sold nine copies of Tender as the Night, seven copies of The Great Gatsby, and no copies of his, any of his books had sold outside of the United States in the last year of his life, which was 1940. Hemingway is a massive star by 1940. What happens is after Fitzgerald dies, Fitzgerald's star starts to rise again and Hemingway's star starts to fall. And Hemingway gets really pissed off that Fitzgerald is starting to be talked about as the, the great American novelist of the 20th century and that The Great Gatsby is being talked about as the great American novel. And he starts to take pot shots at it all over the place. So um, I think with Hemingway, and, and this may sound like I don't like Hemingway, Hemingway is a, is, was, was a very fine writer. I think he's a very, very interesting person in a lot of ways. But we, anything he says about Scott and Zelda, it, it has to be taken with not a grain of salt, with piles and piles and piles of salt. Um, and lots of people commented on the kind of rivalry that Hemingway and Zelda ended up having. Hi, uh, so to use the word you just used, that Fitzgerald wanted to be the biggest writer that ever lived, mm. uh, and Great Gatsby did not turn out to be a fail, uh, commercial success. So what was the effect of that on Fitzgerald personally and his writing later? Yeah, um, it eventually it pretty much destroyed him. Um, it, it, he, um, what, it, it had a couple of really important effects. It made him lose confidence. He knew he'd written a masterpiece. He was writing to his friends saying, I've done something really marvelous. I've done something really, really great. And then critics didn't get it. And they couldn't see what it was that he had done. And um, of course, he was disheartened as anybody would be. Then there was a little upsurge when he realized that some of the great writers of the time did think it was great. So T.S. Eliot said that it was the first step forward that American fiction had taken since Henry James. Gertrude Stein said, you're, you're, you're inventing the modern world. Um, so he's, some of the writers that he respects uh, tell him that he's actually done something important. But he got, he started to listen to his critics and he, and he was always trying to prove himself. So he takes off in a different direction, which becomes tender as the night eventually. And so he starts writing a different kind of a book about different sorts of things. And, um, and Tender was really, although it's a beautiful book and a wonderful book in many ways, he came to view it by the end of his life as something of an aberration. Um, and he actually wrote to his daughter, uh, Scotty, this is a very quick line, just before he died, he said to her, he was working on his unfinished last novel, The Last Tycoon, he said, I wish now I'd never relaxed or looked back, but said at the end of The Great Gatsby, I've found my line, from now on this, com this comes first, this is my immediate duty, without this I am nothing. So that the great Gatsby he sees uh, by the end of his life as his great achievement, but the fact that that was never ever recognized, um, it, it drove him to despair. And, and his alcoholism uh, uh, started to, to win out. And of course one of the ironies about why it didn't do well at the time is that it was seen as being too realistic. Yeah. Uh, that it seemed to capture in its pages all the things that was happening and you know, bootleggers, uh, murders, uh, and people said, oh, you know, we could get this novel out of the headlines yeah. in the newspaper. They said it was just a book of the season. They said, so basically it was, you mentioned hello, you know, the Daily Mail earlier. So basically they just thought it was a kind of, it was a trashy tabloid novel about trashy tabloid figures. 
and they and they all just sort of said this is this is just ephemeral this is disposable this is airport you know the equivalent of, of airplane reading and they, they said things like Fitzgerald's just messing around he's just puttering around I can't see what it is that he's doing and what I tried to show in my book by retracing the actual newspaper stories that Fitzgerald and his friends were reading and, and to try to recreate the, the actual context of the world that they lived in is to give a sense of why the critics would have felt that because it was so close that they couldn't see the, the meaning in all of this that he had found and that he had found pattern in the chaos and they couldn't see it. They were much too close to it. Hello. Uh, Ma'am, my question is, uh, is the death of Gatsby a mockery on the concept of keeping hope? Sorry, can you say that? I couldn't, did you yeah, hear sure. yeah. I think she said, is the, is the death of Gatsby a mockery on the concept of keeping hope? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think it's a mockery. I think it's a lament. Um, but I think that Fitzgerald and Nick Carraway admire Gatsby for keeping, hanging on to hope even when there's no reason to hang on to hope anymore. He has a wonderful line where he, um, as Gatsby realizes that Daisy is slipping away from him, um, Fitzgerald writes, only the dead dream lived on, right? That, it's, that he, he, uh, he, he admires uh, Gatsby's unwillingness to let it go, but he also sees that that destroys him. So I don't think it's a mockery. I think it's a, it's a tragedy. Cheryl has, uh, in Great Gatsby, called his female protagonist Daisy, mm. and that's the name he's used more than once in his books. I'm very intrigued by that. Mm. Why do you think he has? Mm. Um, the question is, is why, uh, why is she called Daisy? Um, I think that, I mean, there, we said earlier he's a symbolic writer, and he's choosing names that have certain kinds of resonances. Um, and the way that I read Daisy there is that she is, it's a, it's a, first of all, it's a nice southern girl's name, so it's the kind of, it's the right feel for what he's trying to do. Um, and of course, a, a daisy is a pretty flower, but it's not, in, in America certainly, it's seen as a, as a, it's not a very, it's not a very exciting flower, you know? It's just sort of pretty and it's, um, and it's kind of a weed, you know? Um, and so I think that it's a way of suggesting that she's, that she, do, that she doesn't go very deep, that she's not a, she's not a rose or an orchid, she's not a, she's not exotic and fabulous, she's just sort of pretty, and that there's not much there. That's one way of reading it, but there are other ways of reading it. I think that he's also using names and, and that we don't, you know, I don't think Tom Buchanan has any, you know, symbolic meaning. I think that he's just finding the sounds and the, and the names that he, that he wants to use. He does like to use flower names though, yes. And of course Myrtle um, is also, and I think Myrtle does have, Myrtle Wilson, um, it does have more uh, symbolic resonances, but um, but yeah, I I would be a little bit wary of reading too much into the name myself. Yeah, uh, just to follow up immediately on that, what do you make of those two pages, which is just a list of names people invited to the party? Yeah, very precise. Yeah, given that you already said that he lets everything float, and then there's this, yeah. Yeah, um, that's the, the list at the beginning of chapter four, the famous list of the people who attend Gatsby's parties that Nick jots down um, on the back of a timetable. Um, I think there's a couple ways to read that list. One is that he's giving us a sense of what cafe society looked like at the time, that it's a mix of, that it's this decadent world that's a mix of aristocrats and gangsters and, um, and fakers and frauds and they all come to no good. He, he lets us know that most of them drown and die and commit suicide and end up in jail. And um, So it's a way of, in a shorthand, of suggesting uh, the, not just the decadence, but the, um, the, the corruption and the, and the, the sort of mingling of, of, of high and low that's happening in, um, in America at the time. The kind of the parties that Scott would have gone to. Absolutely. And, the, and it's satirical. I mentioned earlier that I think it's a much more satirical novel than, than we sometimes pay attention to because we're caught up with the poetry. And um, he's, the, the, a lot of the names are fishy um, in, in that sense. So like, that's a pun. I think he's playing games with fishy people. And um, they're oily. They have names like Civet. And, um, uh, and, and he's, just, he's, making fun of, he's making fun of these people. It's one of the moments that you get the tone that he doesn't think that Gatsby's parties are cool. And again, this is why I think Lerman gets it wrong. Fitzgerald thinks they're full of slightly silly people. In fact, it's, um, it's one thing you keep coming back to is, of course, uh, Fitzgerald didn't want to call his book Great Gatsby. No. He wanted to call it Trimalchio or Trimalchio in West Egg. And Trimalchio, as, as many of you will know, is a, is a character from uh, the Satyricon of Petronius. It's a fragment, um, an ancient fragment, 
uh, which tells the story of, an, of, a, of a parvenu. Um, Tramalchio is, is a wealthy merchant who throws these extravagant parties and um, is incredibly boastful and he talks about how much money he has and he's always flaunting his jewels and he's, um, and he's, and he's, making, up, he's making up kind of name dropping stories. He claims to have talked to, the, to this uh, Cumaean Sybil. Um, and, uh, and Fitzgerald sees Gatsby as a Tramalchio figure, as someone who is um, this slightly embarrassing, boastful, slightly ridiculous uh, figure. And, and he fought hard to keep the, the name Tramalchio, but Scribner's, his publishers, uh, was against it. So you'll probably be glad that the publishers won out. Yeah, uh, very. But I think he, so the he, said, he, <laughs> said, uh, he said to his editor, he said, in my heart, it will always be called Tramalchio. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, uh, I have two questions for you. Here. Oh, sorry, I can't see you. Yeah, yeah, you? right here. Oh, hi, sorry. Uh, right, the first one is uh, at a very pivotal juncture uh, in the novel, uh, one of the characters. Can you hold the mic a little closer? Is it better? Yeah. Yeah. So at a crucial juncture in the novel, uh, Nick kind of, I think he turns 30. And uh, the tone that he assumes uh, becomes slightly gloomy and bleak compared to the you know, rosy colored, uh, glamorous tone uh, used before. So uh, uh, it kind of struck me that maybe that was uh, sort of autobiographical. Uh, when you read about uh, Fitzgerald, it's, uh, you know, he strikes you as a figure uh, you know, who had his eyes set on conquering the world and setting off, you know, riding into the sunset, you know, something like that. Mm. So, uh, is that something you would... Uh... Yeah, I mean, as I say, I think that there are aspects of Fitzgerald in both Nick Carraway and, uh, and Jay Gatsby. And, but I, I think it is definitely a novel, and we want to be, be careful about reading it too much as a, as a kind of autobiography. I think it's more that he shares certain sensibilities with those characters, but definitely the, the flip side of that, of that, what he calls Gatsby's romantic readiness, is also a strong sense of elegy of lost possibility and lost paradise. And of course, Gatsby is a novel about lost paradises. And so Nick is also going to be the, the kind of the dark, the dark poet of what's been lost as well. And, and, so, and that's what I meant earlier by saying that I think it's, a, it's also a dark novel, not just a glittering one. So it's Nick who's responsible for those shifts in tone. Um, and, um, and I think Fitzgerald's doing that very deliberately. Guys, I'm afraid this is it. Uh, but Sarah will be signing.